Hi, my name is Rob Allo. I'm the Director of Enterprise Information Management at Prudential Financial. I'm also the lead data architect for our enterprise uh, global technology group. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our journey around data democratization. Very tough word to say uh, on what day is today, Tuesday. Uh, so Prudential has been around for a while. It's been around for 140 years. It does a lot of uh, uh, life insurance annuities, retirement related services, uh, mutual funds, a lot of a lot of areas in financial for not only individuals, but for government and for corporate customers. And we do have operations across the, uh, the world nowadays. Um, what our challenges were initially, uh, probably not uncommon to everybody here, and, and Seth made a good point of uh, around a lot of these issues here. So Prudential is made up of about uh, eight, eight or nine different business units. And then there's the enterprise group, which is where I sit. And what we were able to see is that a lot of the governance and data architectures, a lot of these things are fragmented across the organization. Uh, inconsistent adoption, some people were doing it great, some people not so great, just kind of getting into it, not exactly sure. So there's kind of this disconnect around uh, things like governance and the, and the data architectures across the, uh, the organization that was somewhat fragmented and, and disconnected. Um, one of the biggest things that we saw was there's no central data catalog or, or any kind of metadata management that really tied into the, the governance as well. Um, all of this translated into kind of haphazard data operations. There was no uh, structure around the life cycle and how to manage the data coming in or how it gets consumed. Uh, and then ETL everywhere. Again, this is kind of uh, probably common to a lot of groups, but I think in Prudential's case, because we're so uh, large and have different business units that, that kind of uh, work around these things is it was kind of uh, magnified to some level um, and along all of that came the data quality where there was lack of standards and, and, and uh, the amount of, da of data that we have across so many different systems I mean we're talking 140 years of data sitting on paper and pen uh, mainframe all kinds of uh, uh, database technologies everywhere so all of these things were the challenges that we saw when, we, when I first joined Prudential. And we were looking for a tool to kind of help us bring this fragmentation back together again in some, some fashion. What we, we did was we went on a learning uh, 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 around data virtualization tools. And what our approach was, we, we identified about four test cases across uh, in, in a single business unit. And um, we kind of looked for things that how do we make it better, faster, cheaper to get that fragmented data into some sort of uh, structure that we can take to a larger uh, enterprise level. Um, how do we facilitate some of the operations that are involved in some of that? How do we incorporate some of the enrichment and quality services that we started building in, in our architecture into these processes? So we're kind of putting a layer over uh, all of these uh, disparate systems to try to come up with some sort of structure uh, that could be consumable in, in many different fashions across the enterprise or more uh, available to people around uh, the organization. So we looked at the scoring here in terms of uh, the virtualization tools that we looked at, you know, the one tool we picked, um, we rated it very highly for connectivity because it could connect to anything. It connected to Excel and we have access databases sitting here and there and, uh, you know, a lot of reference data being stored in, in different systems, even Word for that matter, but we have Oracle and SQL Server. We have a bunch of uh, open source products as well. Um, the tool allowed us to drag and drop and reuse and extend across these different platforms. So we can take an Excel data uh, structure and, and something out of Oracle and bring them together and make it look like one object to the consuming applications downstream. Scored very high on that. The, the consuming side, how did we take those objects that we've created and, and allow them to be uh, uh, ingested or consumed via, via traditional ODBC, JDBC type of connectors, and even now uh, through REST APIs that we were able to create on top of this platform. Um, it, the plot product that we purchased actually came with a data catalog. We were taking that to the next level where we were able to uh, see the assets that are being exposed in, in that platform and see those objects as they're created and be able to add tagging and, and, and have people rate the uh, validity around or usability around those assets as it were. Um, the, the security was based, in, uh, based on our LDAP uh, uh, platform. We, we plugged it right in and it, and it worked really well for us in terms of uh, who we allow access to what. 
and the performance is pretty good. There's um, a lot of optimizations that built into the particular platform that we purchased. Um, there's the auditing capabilities, and we did increase uh, the uh, ability for people to gain access to the data center across these uh, disparate platforms. So once we got started with the platform and plugged it into our overall architecture from an enterprise perspective, we were starting to see uh, a great deal of potential in terms of all these other capabilities that, that were uh, uh, provided to us through the single platform. So all our source data is, um, in fact, the, the way we were getting data started to grow. Of course, most of the time, everything, most of everything is ETL in today's world. But now we're starting to see different things in terms of streaming and even APIs that are, that are allowing us to, uh, uh, you know, manage the data movement as it were as it were, into our overall architecture. So we started this to build this out and we, we laid out uh, an ingestion layer uh, between all those different sources. And we now are straddling here in terms of cloud and on-premise data lake. Prudential hasn't made a 100% leap into uh, a single cloud provider. We're kind of in that hybrid mode at the moment where we're dealing with data lakes and data that's coming across these different sources. And we may actually have parts of that data going into on-prem and some in the cloud, but we're kind of straddling that right now uh, in our overall architecture. Uh, and then we put the data virtualization on the other side of this. So what we're able to do is support the consumption side through this virtualization platform because we're dealing with different data lakes, different locations of that, of that data, uh, different sources. Um, the virtualization actually helped us create a, a management layer or, or the delivery layer on top of those disparate sources here. And you know where it supports our analysts and researchers and the, all the data scientists that are doing the consumption on this level. What we didn't lose out on is the administration, management, and of course, the security aspects around, uh, around all this. But what we did find out, once we started building this out, the, the reality was we were able to incorporate some of the metadata management pieces that provided to us uh, from the virtualization platform and, and incorporate that into more structured uh, governance uh, within the overall organization. And the way that happened was that we were, we were starting to notice that virtualization, yeah, we can connect to anything and produce a single aspect around those disparate sources, but we were able to see the metadata management component that was built into the virtualization. And we took advantage of that. We made that, uh, uh, you know, we we added it as part of our uh, our development processes, SDLC, if you will, where development teams and the data owners uh, and data stewards are actually going into the virtualization platform and adding the bits and pieces that define what these assets are. So the metadata was actually a pl this provided us that one spot where metadata management can actually happen, and then we found out that that actually turned into some some parts of the data governance processes that were. Uh, uh, being created or, or in, enhanced and allowed us to start incorporating more of that uh, the governance processes right into this platform. We built on the security. We, we already have our LDAP uh, Active Directory processes in play. Uh, the virtualization platform plugged directly into that. We, we kind of put the whole premise of security back into the data ownership uh, responsibility and made them accountable for it. Because they're the ones that control those groups. They're the ones that control who can gain access to that data. It wasn't an IT function, it never was actually. So in this case, we're now able to do a little bit better job of getting our stewards and, and owners to actually take charge of uh, the security through our, our current processes already in place for who gets added to groups and, and whatnot. The catalog turned into another component that really helped us uh, get the enterprise to discover what was out there, what was going on inside uh, all of these different disparate systems at this level, at this layer. We can see, we can expose the objects that were created and people can actually go in there and see what those objects are, what's included in them, what kind of data quality and, uh, you know, the tagging and all that um, uh, ability for people to say, hey, I, I've got, this is really good data, I've used it for this kind of stuff. So we kind of added that social piece to the data catalog is not only acting like you would a, an e-commerce site to search for data assets, but it, it kind of gives the ability of people to say, hey, this was really good or it wasn't. Or if, uh, if a data scientist, for example, finds a data asset through the catalog that 
that really uh, sounds like something that person should need, there's actually a button there that, that they would click to say, hey, I, I'd like to get access to this data. And that goes into our uh, business processes that, that allow the owner of that data to say yes or no to that person. So we have, uh, we took IT out of that process and we kind of facilitated through already in, in both processes, already processes are already established so that the ownership of the data owners can take control of who gets access and, and what and people who can discover can ask for that access and don't have to fool around with who who's the person i need to talk to what group is that etc so we, that catalog really turned into a huge piece of what we would what the virtualization platform allowed us to move forward with we also went further because of the extendability of virtualization uh we've we've been able to add microservices directly in the platform that uh deal with uh, uh, hygiene and, and uh, enrichment. All of this came kind of like, well, we built out this micro framework for um, data quality, enrichment, et cetera. And we're kind of haphazardly using it through all our ETL and ingestion processes. But now we have the capability of putting all those pieces directly here. So the exposure of data with some layer of, with the layer of uh, data quality is now happening directly inside this. So the, again, we pushed this back to the ownership, uh, not made it necessarily an IT function, made it uh, the data owners and their stewards who can work with, where do we need this kind of encryption? Where do we need this kind of hygiene? And we work with them from an IT perspective to say, yeah, we have these services. How do we help you make this better than it is? So um, and I talked a little bit about metadata because of the fact that the virtualization platform allowed us to manage a lot of that metadata. Uh, embed all those business rules and things like that that we wanted to do. This turned out to be a real easy way for us to kind of not have to go back and remediate everything from the start uh, of the supply chain here, the data supply chain here, but kind of work through the detail and make sure that, you know, if we have a one-to-one -one mapping from our data sources into a lake, we're able to em embed those rules and those quality components, the metadata management, all of that started to become that one exit of the funnel, if you will where we can put all those details in, into, that, uh, into that layer. So that's our current architecture. It's growing, obviously. This is, not, this is kind of really generic in the sense of, of what it is. There's so many details in here. But we're doing a lot of, to focus on this platform here and incorporate all of these things as an outcome. But the real message here is that we didn't realize that we had all these capabilities until we started using this. So the virtualization was good for us from the initial point of view where we had all these disparate systems and all this disparate data uh, and we were able to kind of manipulate that through a virtualization into into more structured uh, objects but then as we started digging into this we took advantage of all the capabilities that are available and started building into this layer uh, all of, and get all these different benefits from here so in speaking of benefits, we, we, we built out our master data mastering component. We actually built something that took the master data from the disparate sources because we're not, not everything's coming through the virtualization platform as of yet. But we're able to look at metadata from different perspectives and kind of built this uh, process that allowed us to kind of quote unquote master metadata. It's not exactly mastering as an MDM type of mastering, but it kind of gets us to the point where we can say, hey, you know, this this element in this uh, uh, business object here or, or that's used there, this is all the details around it, what it means. It also helped us in the discovery portion of it when we expose the metadata out to our uh, data catalog. So in essence, it really does help us provide that governance tool in a more natural, natural method or more natural way. Um, we reduced a lot of the complexity in our, our, in our architectures, the data discovery uh, uh, and access to request workflows just kind of fell right in and made the processes of all uh, related to just finding data that may exist or maybe wanted to be consumed uh, uh, that much easier. Um, the operations, we kind of, you know, I like to talk about enabling power users. There, there are power users and then there are power users, but, but the power users that really understand how to do mapping and, and, and look at data assets in that sense can use this tool to kind of build new assets, which is kind of neat. One of the other things that, that I really loved uh, as an outcome of this was the leapfrog effect. So if we have, um, uh, we have systems that are on a mainframe and we're working through processes to, to redevelop those on, on a newer modernized platform, whether it's uh, you know, B2 
DB2 or SQL Server, whatever, whatever the case is, or cloud solutioning. The virtualization platform actually allows us to keep the consuming side of the business using the same platform. They don't know the difference. And then back end behind the virtualization, we can actually switch back and forth between the different data sources without the consuming side knowing. So that that kind of old timers like me might understand, you know, that you know, instead of doing a big bang type of uh, uh, implementation, we're kind of doing this leapfrogging effect that, that helps us kind of manage uh, how these uh, systems are, um, are growing or evolving. And of course, our data quality, I'm really proud of the microservices that our team put together in terms of how we do the enrichment and how do we supply uh, uh, the quality uh, components and things like that, and really created for that plug and play that we can do across the whole architecture. So we did a lot of work here. Um, and, and, the, and the virtualization platform did help us get here. It did a lot of help. It, it helped us do a lot to get to this point where we can start um, going down this journey of making things easier and, and faster for people to get to. Uh, so in the future, our architecture, uh, this is a holy grail, of course, where everybody wants to be. You know, We have governance behind everything and everything's aligned to the business strategy and our data strategy, uh, where we're talking about people, process, and the policies, of course, uh, related to data and the culture around how data consumed or even generated, uh, trying to get more in that modern, modern day uh, look and feel around how data is discovered and uh, the whole idea of being able to access things without going nuts or trying to talk to 10 different people to figure out what, what's what or who's doing what. Um, so all these services kind of plug right into that where we have uh, visualization, the consuming side can be any type of, uh, we've got many, uh, visualization platforms that we leverage across this thing. We can see the lineage, the lineage is there that helps as part of the data governance aspect of this data registration. When people create new uh, assets, it's kind of all built into this, uh, all these services are kind of just built right into what we're building now as part of this uh, process of introducing uh, the overall data fabric that we're, that we've created here. So, so again, this is where we're headed. There's, um, there's a lot of support for quality and of course uh, uh, supporting movement from either uh, data storage, whether it's in the cloud or not, or hybrid, um, and the integration space where we're trying to move away from ETL more away from ETL, or at least take away the T, where we're starting to see more uh, data streaming type of processes. And even if they're large, num uh, large batches of data, uh, just getting them to point from point A to point B or cut that copy and then being able to do the details around uh, the business rules for specific to that consuming system. So there's a lot of work that we're building out into this architecture, but it's, it's all kind of growing and enabled by that data fabric that, uh, that we've kind of honestly stumbled across and now putting into play uh, in, into uh, Prudential. So uh, that's it for me. I hope that was useful. Mary D. Great, thank you, Ralph. Um, we do have some questions here. Uh, this first one is for Ralph, but after he's answered it, I'd like Seth to jump in with his thoughts on it as well. So, <clears throat> Ralph, you talked about uh, data architecture being managed outside IT group. Um, would you like to know, or if, yes, would, this person would like to know more about how did the team start? How is the ongoing development being managed? And how is business non-tech team's role in this? Well, everything we do is for the business, right? So they're the ones that, that build out the requirements for us. They're the ones that define what they're looking for, what they need. What we, from an IT perspective, at least in my team, what we're trying to do is build a common standard across the uh, enterprise in terms of an architecture. The data fabric is just a piece of that, and virtualization plays a big part of that, uh, that architecture, that platform. And it's kind of like, um, you know, we, we create models that are reusable across different processes, different business components, et cetera, but it's always about the data. And the architecture has to be, uh, you know, not only support what the business is looking for, but it also has to be easy to maintain. And, and you know, and, and, and Seth kind of talked to this a little bit in terms of how, you know, Technology, the way we implemented years ago, it's, and you had, a, you had an anecdote about this, right, Seth, where you, the developers are kind of controlling what's being built. And it's kind of losing sight of what the business is looking for. Where's the business value? And, and what we're trying to do is exactly the opposite. Yes, we want our developers to stay creative. We want them to be 
you know, great at what they do and, and you know, componentizing things like through microservices and all that stuff. Uh, it helps a lot. They can still be creative, but we're kind of trying to keep them in track or at least on track to where the real value is to the business. So from, from a business perspective, what we're, what we're asking from them is more about, it, you have this data, let's, let's see what we can share. What, and we give them more control. So that was kind of the objective. We want to give them the ability to say, yeah, I want people to see this, or no, I don't want people to see this. And we have all mm -hmm. these factors built in to kind of control uh, exposure, if you will. So they, they, they have a huge play in this, uh, the development team as well. We're trying not to try to keep everybody <laughs> on the same level to deliver exactly what that business value is. Seth? Seth? Yeah, that, I, totally, I totally agree with, <clears throat> with the thinking because you know, the business does have to take more responsibility for, uh, for managing the data and understanding the data and getting value from the data. You know, IT, give, you know, I'll give you a quick example. When you think about uh, IT being responsible for data, you can have a situation in sales where salespeople don't put the data into the CRM. And people might complain about the bad data, but wait a minute, how's IT going to solve that problem? That is a compliance problem and a user problem on the data entry, right? So it's upstream. So many times IT is kind of stuck holding the bag when uh, someone else should have been, they, they, can't, they can't solve that problem. It has to be solved upstream. It has to be solved at the source. So business needs to understand those dependencies, understand what their role is, understand the other processes that impact, impact their data and understand the chain of trust to, you know, what, what goes into getting their data to the point where they can use it and do they trust it and do they know where it comes from and do they know what the issues are and what questions do they need to answer and they need to have enough savvy about the data and about the technology to be able to pose those questions and have knowledge of what to do with those answers because Again, you know, there's too much of, oh, data, that's technology, that's IT. No, 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 that is the business. The business has to own their data. IT is an enabler. IT will put up standards, they'll put up infrastructure, they'll help with processes, they'll help get their, house, their data house in order. But moving forward, the business has to not only support that financially because there are costs and, and the costs and the benefits are not always evenly distributed. So many times somebody else is responsible upstream for a data problem that is negatively yeah. impacting them. So that chain of, of trust has to happen. So the business has to be intimately involved and they have to be an active partner and there has to be expertise embedded in the business for any of these areas in order for them to get the greatest value. It sounds like it's not just governance, it's communication. It's yes. Also. Well, and governance is about communication too, right? There's a lot right. of... Uh, socialization, communication strategies, ongoing training, buy-in. Yes, there's a lot of that in there. Absolutely. I have another question here. This is, this is a very specific one, and I think it's just for you, Ralph. Uh, can you provide some insight about Data Lake? Is that HDFS, S3, or some other storage system? We're using HDFS on-prem and S3 out in, in the cloud, but we do have a mix of others. There's, there's still some RDMS out there. And, uh, uh, okay. It's, it's, it's diverse, a lot. Diverse, a lot all right. Good, but good. Yes, those are the two, te the two specific ones, HDFS. Okay, all right. Um, I, I guess one of the things that struck me is that you were both talking about um, data quality. And it, it just seems to me that we have been talking about data quality for ever. Ever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, dirty, dirty there, question. Um, around do, do, ever. <laughs> yeah. Been around ever, yeah. I think we started back in... Yeah. Yeah. Is there ever actually going to be a solution to this? Well, well, Steve, go ahead, Steve. it's a really good question because uh, it's it, there's no solution. It's only an ongoing process. It's like saying, is there a solution to to product quality, right, or manufacturing quality? Yeah. Right. Once you get the processes working, yes, you can have better quality. But then things change and you have new data and you have new data sources and the processes. So you're going to have to constantly do that. That's why the remediation has to get back to the root cause. And yeah. that's why you need ongoing scorecards because things are changing. 
Right. So it's not so much a matter of we're going to fix data quality, but we're going to improve our data hygiene. And when you think about, you know, you look at structured versus unstructured and uh, mm -hmm. finance organizations, they've gotten a pretty good handle on transactional data. And you don't get people, yeah. you know, complaining about, uh, like it, you get people complaining about tagging data, tagging metadata, you know, managing and actively managing their, their content, their unstructured data. But you don't get people in the accounting department going, oh, my God, entering all those numbers into those systems and they have to all add up and, and tie. Yeah. It's too much work, right? That is their job. And that is the value of the organization to having that data. So we have to look at all of our data assets from a, single, a similar uh, perspective. What is that value? If, they, if the value is there, we have to put the energy into actively managing it. If there's no value, fine. Don't bother, but what they're what organizations are doing, they're taking high value data mm -hmm. and assets and they're throwing them into a shoebox and they're not able to get them back. And they're wondering why they, you know, why the user experience is bad, why they're recreating things and so on. But we would never do that on the infrastructure. I saw an organization spend $150 million on an ERP application in a single year. And then the budget to do so that was the, the structured data. The budget to deal with the unstructured data and the knowledge assets, $300,000. Not even the coffee budget, you know what I mean? Like $300,000, $150 million to fix this problem, $300,000 to fix this problem. What is That's wrong with that picture? Because lots. you cannot have, <laughs> you're, you're going to lose all that value of all that other data because you're not actively curating it, managing it, and being proactive about um keeping it high quality and appropriate. Well, isn't that though actually one of the issues with data quality? That the formats of our data have changed drastically yeah. over time. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's an always, it's, it's, it's a continually uh, evolving environment and situation. And that's why it's so important to be proactive about it. And even if you're intentional about ignoring something, be intentional about it. Like if it's good enough, Fine, it's good enough. If you're using a folksonomy to tag draft things and nobody cares about them and it's good enough, it's good enough. But if you have a situation where you say, geez, we really need to get this process better. Oh, mm -hmm. this data isn't mm -hmm. you know, high quality. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are we doing to manage it? Where you have to really go back through the value chain. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Ralph? It, well, Dave Pauly's not an example. It keeps evolving. I mean, we keep talking about, well, you know, what is bad quality? data, who defines what bad data is, and how do you know, if you do change it, if you do enrich it, if you like it, yeah. how do you keep the lineage? Which, to Seth's point, right. you know, it, it involves a cultural change. The data owner mm -hmm. is the one responsible for that quality. So if you're sitting downstream, right. and correct, or our, our service is to say, hey, there's something wrong with this, or whatever, yeah. where does it go? What's so interesting? What's, right. yeah, what's so interesting is executives around the table, you talk to them, they'll say, data is really critical. Data is important. We run an organization on data. We're a data driven organization. And you say, okay, here's what it's going to take to fix these problems. Whoa, it's not that valuable. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a funny Data it's a funny is so problem. valuable. Oh, it's not that valuable. Right? It's not I that mean, valuable. <laughs> that's, because, that's because they're not looking at the criticality of that data in these organizational yeah. processes. Yeah. And what happens is we slow down. The information yeah. flows, we slow down the information metabolism inexorably from lots of, it's like getting pecked to death by ducks, right? It's <laughs> lots of yeah. little incremental yeah. things that are slowing things down. And it's, the, and it's the frog boiling in the water. You don't notice how bad it is because it's just the way you got used to it. Then yeah. all of a sudden you take it all away. You're like, oh my God, this is a new way to do business. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we're so having it. We actually put the ownership uh, in charge of that. They are the ones that we tell them, what's your critical data? What's your critical data element, right? Define it, put it in the yeah. metadata, because then it becomes yeah. downstream uh, consumable and everybody now knows, oh, right. well, you know, this person well, put this as right. a critical data element. We could obviously talk about awesome. this for several more hours. hours. <laughs> yes. But we yes. are out of time on this webinar. Oh, um, okay. I would like fun. to, what? <laughs> I would like that to thank fun. Seth and Ralph because you. Uh, you both did yeah. great presentations.